Every morning when I wake to see the sun, I can't help but think about the Lord and all that he has done. He meets my every need. You see, he's been so good to me, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done, for all he's done. I want to lift my hands and praise him for all he's done. I'm trying to live my life and please him. And even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun and I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. Now there are many things that I could praise God for. And if I started now until I died, there'd still be many more. But if I could name just one, I'd like to thank him for his son. Now that's enough to praise the Lord for all he's done, for all he's done. morning in the first service, I ask each side to at least one person to share something good that God has done in your life. So let's start right here. What's something good that God has done? <laughs> Woke you up. I'm on this side right now, but, but praise God for waking Mickey up. Now let him go back to sleep. So, okay. Anybody over here? Gave you your husband. Yeah. All right. How many of you ladies can thank God for your husbands? Oh, you better put your hand up. You better put your hand up. Hey, welcome to worship this morning. We are so glad that you're here. And we have some folks that have been out because of the COVID. And uh, you're back today. Uh, we have some folks visiting with us. So we are just rejoicing in the Lord this morning uh, for your presence here. A couple of great things happening this week. Uh, tomorrow night, Michael is going to be doing trivia, but doing it again at Jack's, sort of uh, like over coffee style. So come down about 6 o'clock, I believe, 6 o'clock, and uh, right down here at the base of the, uh, the hill, and we'll have a uh, good fellowship, uh, talking back and forth, and also then uh, get to play trivia. Uh, the theme for tomorrow night is Saints. Saints, yes, and remember, the key answer is Saint Bill. St. Bill. Okay. Then, uh, Thursday, Big River has uh, invited Michael to come back and sing. So he'll be doing a couple of uh, concerts uh, run together or whatever. So if you get a chance to come over to Big River and the rain stopped and everything, we'll be outside on the patio to come over anytime, 4.30 to 6.30 or whatever. And let's just have a, a great, great evening. I uh, want to lead you in prayer. And you know it was a year ago today that
the staff, we stood out there with the sound and camera crew and the police cars pulled up, you know, uh, the blue lights going and Chattanooga was in a total shutdown. And so we did that worship service and I want to tell you, it's a whole lot better to be inside today with all of you. And yeah, we, we thank God for that. So, so let's, uh, let's just offer a word of prayer, okay? Lord, you are so awesome and so good to us. And this year, I guess, God, I speak for everybody in this room. There have been so many dark, difficult days that we all have been emotionally and spiritually depressed physically challenged in so many ways and now God we have risen to the top of the peak and the storm may not be over but God you are master of the storm and we cling close to you and may our faithfulness Lord shine as a bright light in the darkness for others today we want to celebrate your love your grace and mercy so speak to us and Lord we celebrate you in our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. And I echo Bill in saying how good it is to see all of you here in person. And uh, by the way, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had somebody on the screen here. Uh, and uh, he has now joined us live and in person. Gary Ross is with us this morning. It's so good that Gary is here with us. And, uh, and by the way, look at our worship team this morning. I said this in the first service. If you could knock this microphone down just a little further. Just a th thank you. Take care of it. <laughs> so, uh, oh, he, he's sneaking over grabbing another microphone. So, uh, but it's so good to see all of you here this morning. If you are joining us Facebook Live, thank you for joining us. We know if you're watching live, you could be a million places right now and you chose to be with us. Please hit the share button and share this out with someone. If you have a phone or a mobile device on you right now and you're in the room, hit the share button so other people can watch this later on. But right now, what I want to ask you to do is just stand up where you are, maybe greet somebody this morning, wave at them, tell them good morning, and we'll sing this. To God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son. Who yielded His life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. of quartet music break out those parts we got a couple of basses and we got a two thorns and a flower back here i think is what we have but uh but singing this with us i believe in a hill called mount calvary Yeah. 
want you to continue standing with us. If you are able, if you need to grab a seat, please do. But if you can stay standing with us as we sing, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Lift your voices and sing this morning. Sing it, Holy. morning. Hey, Bella, will you come up here and help me with a song real quick? Hey, you guys can grab a seat real quick so you can see Bella here, but uh, I asked her if she'd come up and sing with us on a song here in the chorus of What a Beautiful Name. You going to sing this with us? Can y'all sing with us now? It goes like this. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Oh, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a beautiful name it is. Sing it with us. What a beautiful name it is. The name Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. 
Well, Bella came tearing into town from a little vacation last night, and uh, and then she had a karate tournament last night. So watch out, fellas. Um, Dad doesn't have to look out for Bella. Bella can take care of herself. But uh, it's good to see all of y'all here this morning once again. And right now as we come to this point in the service, it's just a time where we write in our service order the prayer course. And it's a time to get alone with the Lord and just uh, talk with the Lord right now and specifically thank Him for something this morning. Um, Bill has given something very good that we can thank the Lord for this morning. One year ago, pretty much today, we were all sent different directions. We were isolated. We were here as the pastors and then Pat and a couple of us uh, just doing music on our own. And it was just a weird thing. And uh, in the past year, it's given me an appreciation of being able to come together and be with people. And I think sometimes you get to the point where you don't even realize how much you miss it and how much you needed it. Uh, you know, until you get back and you go, wow. I really needed that, and that's why, you know, God tells us in the scripture when he says, forsake not, forsake not, don't neglect it, neglect not, forsake not, assembling together. So praise the Lord that we're able to assemble here together this morning, and I pray that he is pleased. So right now, if you'd just bow your heads and close your eyes and talk to the Lord this morning for just a moment, thank him for something, and we'll sing another song here in a moment, but don't miss this opportunity. this morning. We thank you for the gift of music that we can enjoy. We can enjoy the melodies, the harmonies, the rhythms. God, we just thank you so much for that. But God, we return it to you. Sing songs about you. Songs for you. Songs to you. And God, we are so grateful for what this time of year means to us as we see everything coming back to life. God, what a reminder of what it is for us as Christians that we have a life be on this life because of Jesus Christ. So it is my privilege this morning <laughs> to speak on behalf of everyone in this room and anybody who may be watching Facebook Live. God, when I tell you that, we love you. God, we thank you for the gift of salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. Now be with Tony as he brings the message this morning. Speak through him. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, worship leadership team. And thank you, worshipers. It's so good to see you today. I mean, we're constantly seeing folks that we haven't seen in a while, and we welcome you back. 
And again, we say welcome to those of you joining us through Facebook Live. Welcome to those of you who are guests. I usually don't uh, put our guest on the spot. I usually don't want to make it really awkward for them, but there's one man here that I've got to recognize, and I share a story about him. Mr. Don Kelly and his daughter Robin are sitting here towards the front, and uh, Don and I go way back to my childhood. And uh, Don is a uh, neighbor of Gary Ross's, but uh, he, he and I go further back than Gary Ross. We belong to the same church in Rome, Georgia. And as a high school senior, Don and his wife Reba took us on a mission trip to Adams, New York, Upper State, New York. And it was my first ever mission trip. And I just shared with Don just a few minutes ago, I've been in ministry you know, more than 25 years, and a staple in my ministry has been volunteer missions, short-term missions. I've been all over this country, I've been all over the world taking folks and sharing, giving them opportunity to serve. And this man right here had a major impact, he and his wife. And so, Don, welcome to worship, and it's so good to reconnect with you again. And uh, don't be telling any stories on me, okay? Let's keep it truthful now. I've, Don, I've, uh, my job description just kind of grows as a pastor. I've done just about everything until today I did something new. At 8 o'clock this morning, I shared with the first service, I had the task of removing wildlife from the campus. You think I'm joking. No, we had two deer running through the campus, and once they get up here, they can't get out. This fence. And uh, so Vince Vaughn and I were out there herding deer down the hill. And so in the future, if you see a deer crossing sign on campus, please respect that. This is the second time I have had to do this. I'm not joking. This really happened this morning. And so uh, please uh, be on the lookout. Um, my wife, Lana, and I, when we first got married, our first home was a two-bedroom duplex. After a couple of years of marriage, we went to graduate school so I could prepare for ministry. And we went to Fort Worth, Texas. And through the aid of my grandmother, we were able to purchase a mobile home. And from there, we finished our degree and we moved to South Carolina. And in South Carolina, we had the privilege of buying our first house. We were so excited about it. Only one problem. The economy and the market for housing was so bad at that time, there was nothing available. So a contractor in our church says, I want to do you a favor, Tony. I want to build a house for you. And he saved us a lot of money. I'm so grateful but it was an interesting experience to walk through the building of a house, the picking out of the different colors, the patterns, the wallpaper, the flooring, you name it. We learned a lot through that experience. But my parents and Lana's parents didn't live close by. They couldn't see what was happening. So one of us had the brilliant idea that we would video the progress but unfortunately, well, fortunately, we went to a neighborhood that was probably the wealthiest neighborhood in this town. And we drove through there with my video camera hanging out the, the door, and Lana's driving, and I narrated as we went through this neighborhood, and I said, this is our neighbors. Mind you, this was houses three stories high, 4,000 square feet, and I'm going, whoo, this is our neighbors. And I came up on this one house, and they were building it, and it was like, you know, four or five stories high. And I said, Mom, Dad, this is our house. <laughs> they didn't buy it. <laughs> they didn't buy into that idea. But through that whole process, I realized how important, how significant blueprints are. The, the drawings that were given to us of our house had great significance. For this, these blueprints, they served as a guide. These blueprints, they served as a standard. And it made sure that everyone was on the same page. There were so many different contractors and subcontractors involved in this process. 
the plumbers, the electricians, those that were doing the flooring, the AC guy, all of these guys had to work together. And so this served as a standard so that everyone could look back and know what needed to take place. But this also gave direction. It gave direction as we moved into the future. Any plan of action that took place, this blueprint was the driving force. And it also provided us with a purpose. What is it you're trying to accomplish on this piece of land? Everybody had an idea. Everybody knew what we we're trying to do. Last week, Brother Bill shared a powerful message on the cross. Many of you are wearing crosses on your lapels, on your dresses, and uh, we've got more. And these crosses are not for us to, to decorate our clothing, but it's to actually give away. Someone said, I needed five this week. And we said, okay, here, we've got some more out there in the foyer. But that, that message that Brother Bill shared with us last week, very powerful, very significant in what the cross means to us, what the impact of the cross had on our lives, what it means for those of us as followers of Christ. If you didn't see it, it's on YouTube, uh, Search GraceWorks Church Chattanooga, and you'll find all the videos from our church there. You can go and watch it. And if you watched it, uh, if you were here, go watch it again. It's worth watching. But the cross is not the end of the story. Not to take away from anything Brother Bill said last week. But the cross is the beginning. For the cross is where we receive God's forgiveness. But then as we are forgiven people, we're to walk and grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're to grow. And this is where this blueprint idea comes in. Because you and I have a responsibility as followers of Jesus Christ to follow his blueprint. What is the blueprint that he has for us? What is the blueprint for Grace Works Church? What is it that we're trying to accomplish here? You ever ask yourself, why do we come together? Michael's quoted scripture to you, but what is it we're trying to accomplish here? What is the blueprint? What is the purpose? Just so that everyone is on the same page. Just so that we all know everything is driven by the blueprint, I want to give it to you today. And this is, not just some, this is not just for today. The blueprint is how I will lead as pastor. Because everything we do, everything we put on the calendar, should point back to the blueprint. It has great significance then, doesn't it? The blueprint is found in, uh, in Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. This is uh, Jesus speaking to his disciples after he's crucified, after he's been resurrected, and just before he's to ascend to heaven, to the right hand of the Father. Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. If Grace Works was a business and we were manufacturing something, what would that product be? What would that product be? You ever thought about that? Why do we come together? Is it for us to feel good about ourselves? Is it got to make God feel good about himself? Well, here we see that the whole purpose and what we're trying to accomplish is to make disciples. Grace Works Church is to be faithfully pursuing this process of making disciples. Notice I didn't say we are to be making Christians. We're not to be making converts. We're not to be making church members. Jesus' words make disciples. We are to be making disciples. And so what is a, 
What is a disciple? How would you describe a disciple? This is a word that we don't use frequently in the 21st century. Occasionally, we, it may come out, but it doesn't reflect what we find in Scripture. The, probably the closest analogy I can think of is, say, someone like an electrician or maybe a plumber who, who has an apprentice. We have to go back and dig down into the first century in Jewish culture. A disciple was a learner who had a teacher. Jesus, he was referred to as rabbi or teacher. And as you look back at the very beginning of his ministry, what act did Jesus serve? He went out and chose those to be his disciples. Side note, that was not the common practice. The teacher didn't go find the disciple. The disciples would go to the teachers. And in the first century, in Jewish culture, in the rabbinical school, you find that this, the disciple chose to submit to the teacher. The disciple would memorize the words of the teacher. They would learn the way of the, the teacher's ministry. They would also imitate the life of the teacher. And there was an expectation on the disciple. The disciple, as they learn, they in turn find others to be their disciples. In a most literal sense, a disciple is one under the leadership who is learning and living the truth. Learning and living the truth. There was a quote that uh, I read many years ago, and it has stayed with me. It left a major impact on my life. And as you listen to this, you'll see why it is so imperative that you and I take seriously the command that Jesus gives to make disciples. If you make disciples, you get the church. If you try to make the church, you rarely get disciples. If we're very concerned about a large gathering of people, there's a good chance you're not going to make disciples. If we're concerned about numbers, large gatherings, we may not make disciples. But the flip side of that is, if you and I as a church, we focus on this idea of making learners who are living out the truth, you're going to get the church. You're going to get God's intended plan. So what does this, this project look like, this building project? I'm not talking about a brick and mortar building project, of course. I'm talking about this project of making disciples. What is discipleship? What is discipleship? It's not a class. When I was growing up in our small church in Rome, Georgia, we had a class on Sunday nights. It's called discipleship. Or we changed the name of it. There's multiple ways of describing it. But it was a class. And only a few people would show up for discipleship. It was a choice. But that's not what Jesus is speaking about here. Discipleship is not a program. It's not just for the super spiritual or those who are serious about following Jesus. It's not a fad and it's not an option. What I hope you'll see is it should be the big picture of who we are as a church. It should be our heartbeat. That which is most important to us and everything falls back to this idea. Are we truly making disciples? The, this discipleship is that process where we intentionally use God's word. And through the power of the Holy Spirit as it impresses upon us this truth. And it's lived out in our lives. We, with the purpose of faithfully reproducing faithful followers of Jesus Christ. That is discipleship. And that's what Grace Works is to be about. Um, Dawson Trotman was the founder of Navigators, a group that strongly emphasizes this idea of um, discipleship. And Trotman, he points out that uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 
verses 1 and 2, it says, there's a passage here that really emphasizes this idea of disciples who are making disciples, who are making disciples, who are making disciples. First, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, what's the significance of that passage? Trotman would say, this is, this is a mathematical formula for sharing the gospel and enlarging the church. Because in this, you see multiple generations of disciples. If you go back and read that, you've got Paul who says, I've entrusted this message to you, Timothy, and I expect you to entrust it to others who are going to teach others. You've got four generations of disciples that are mentioned here. You see the cycle here that is taking place. Disciples making disciples. And this whole idea of discipleship, it's not for your pastor to disciple you. It's not for one individual to disciple everyone. It's for all who've experienced the power of forgiveness at the cross. To follow him and to make disciples. It's for each one of us to take on this responsibility. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. That means you should be making disciples. There's a pattern of life, truth, life that describes this same cycle. It goes something like this. Your life as a follower of Jesus Christ should, tr should attract others to listen. Your life, my life, should make a difference. People should see something in us. And it should draw them in so that they want to hear what we have to say. And the truth that you share, that should make a difference in them. It should transform their lives. And their lives, as they are transformed, they illustrate the very thing that you and I have passed on. And they, in turn, attract people to listen to them. You see how it just keeps going and going and going? Often, though, our process is to do addition, not multiplication. We want to just say one person, that's for one person. No, it's for all believers. All believers to be involved in this process. So, key question. How will we know if we have built correctly? How will we know if we have followed the blueprint? Well, in my situation, my house, I had a blueprint. I looked at it and I compared it to my house and I said, it follows the standard. It follows the standard. It follows the blueprint that's here on paper. The ultimate result when we make disciples is, is that we're growing in our experience of intimacy with God. But also we reflect the image of Christ. Two words. Two words. Intimacy and image. If we're becoming, if we are making disciples, there should be this growing close to God and looking more like Christ. That's a tall order. And it's a lifelong process. True intimacy with God is more than just emotion. True intimacy with God is not just a feeling that you get when you have a, a, this romantic relationship. Intimacy with God, it goes much deeper. It goes down to your very soul. You know Him, and you're known by Him. This deepness and this closeness to Him will be reflected in our lives. But hear me out, church. There may be a problem. For you see, when we seek intimacy, closeness with God, it will, 
uh, collide with a me attitude. When you and I seek intimacy with God, we want to be close to Him. You can't also have a me attitude. You can't be selfish. And either one of two things are going to happen. Either we're going to have to surrender ourself, our selfish attitudes, or we're going to have to forget about being close with God. The two can't coexist. And when we are building and making disciples, we are growing in the image. We're growing in the reflection of who our Savior is. When you go to the mirror, you look in the mirror, what do you see? Well, this morning it was ugly, trust me, in my house. I do not like time change. I don't like morning. But when you go to the mirror, what do you expect to see? A reflection. But what if you went to the mirror and all of a sudden you saw a totally different person? That wouldn't be right, would it? In Ephesians 4.24, Paul writing to the church, he said, you've been created with a new self and you are to reflect God's righteousness and his holiness. So when you go to that mirror, what are you supposed to see? His righteousness, his holiness. But when you see the world, that's strange. When we consider this idea of being in the image, created in the image, but also reflecting his image, the question should be used to evaluate, do I look more like Jesus today than I did yesterday? Do I look more like Jesus today than I did last year? If we're making disciples and we're growing as disciples, we should say yes. It's a tall order, I know. But we have a big God and an incredible Savior. So, how do we go about building disciples? Or, excuse me, how do we go about making disciples? Today, I'm just sharing with you the plan. Next week, I'm going to share with you the process. So you got to come back. You can't, can't skip out on me next week. But how do we go about this process? What's the nuts and bolts of making disciples? Well, I want to be simple with this. Words I want to use, others have used before. But making disciples is a process in which we are seeking to know Him, grow like Him, and go with Him. Know, grow, go. I've been sharing this with our leadership. I've been sharing it with different groups of people. It's pretty simple. People have been throwing it back to me. Even Michael Prudyman knows. Know, grow, go. That's the way we, we go in staff meeting. We write it down on the board, and this is how it, it, everything falls in these categories. Knowing Him, that is our worship. When we come together to worship together. When you worship personally at home. When you study God's Word. We've got small groups popping up at different times. We want everybody to be involved in small groups. That's your opportunity to grow like Him in a corporate setting. But it doesn't stop there. We want you to also be growing like him in your personal Bible study. And going with him. This is your ministry. This is your service to him. We have ministry teams where we make it opportunities available for you to serve in the local church. But also, personally, how are you ministering and serving in your neighborhood? No, grow, go. There will be a test next week. And I expect everybody to pass with a hundred. But that's, that, that's just a simple version. We'll break that down more next week. The process of making disciples. But what should inspire us? What should inspire us as a church to say, Yeah, Tony, I buy into this idea of making disciples. 
It's scriptural, of course. But do you realize Christianity is not for loners? Christianity is not for individualists. Christianity, we're responsible for each other. You're responsible for the person next to you. Now right now you're probably thinking, okay, I can handle that person next to me. But you're also responsible for the person on the other side of the room. You're responsible for every person in this room. Do you realize we are responsible for each other? Romans chapter 12, Paul writing to the church in Rome, he gave some of the marks of what it looks like to be a true Christian, a true disciple of Jesus. Listen to this in Romans chapter 12, verse 10 and following. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. And never be wise in your own sight. There's a lot there, isn't there? But to summarize that, Paul was saying, you've got a responsibility. Take care of one another. That other person is important. It's not about you. It's about each other. And that's one reason why we should be making disciples. It means taking our lives and orientating them changing them so that we are other focused our lives are centered around others we're giving up ourselves for the sake of others and being a disciple maker means that we're obeying our lord this passage i just read from matthew he said go and make disciples and he goes on there's only one verb in that passage we read it's not go it's make disciples and it is not only a verb it's a command from Jesus but let's look at the context I know you we're finished with our note taking but listen to this this is extremely important here because if you look at the context of it it's all inspiring it should inspire us to passionately seek to make disciples. Because if you look at back at verse 18, he says, All authority has been given me. All authority on heaven and earth. He was saying, All authority. I'm not just Lord over the church. But I'm Lord over history. I'm Lord over Caesar. I'm Lord over all the politicians. I'm Lord over all the nations, all the governments. And this was the affirmation, the early church, when one would say, I am here to follow Jesus Christ. This was what they were saying. All authority has been given to Jesus. And it wasn't just a political statement, but it was a supreme statement, a universal statement. I have authority over all the universe. And then he says, therefore, he takes this idea of authority and he ties it to a command he passes on to us. Must be pretty important. As you're going, make disciples. Make disciples. But he doesn't leave us there. Verse 20, the latter part. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a promise. It's a promise that's found in this idea 
of obedience. As you and I are obeying and making disciples, he says, I'm going to be there. It's easy for me to pull this verse out of context and say, God's with me all the time. Makes me feel good, comfortable, safe. That wasn't the intent. The whole intent was, church, you're to go make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. I'm going to be with you. Your, my spirit is going to come and fill you and use you and equip you so that you might make Christ followers. Those who are learning and living out the truth. This is the blueprint. Grace works. How are we doing? Are we making disciples? And as we move forward, as we see the light at the end of the tunnel, as we feel like this past year we're moving forward, what's going to be our blueprint for the future? Make disciples. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, I thank you for these that have gathered in this place. And Father, I pray as we consider your, your charge to us, your church. Father, I pray that your church at Grace Works would be found faithful. Father, may we take the simple words, make disciples. And everything that we do as a church, may it flow from that. Father, for each person that can hear these words. Father, may each one of us be moved, inspired to seek to know you, to seek to grow like you, and to seek out opportunities to go with you. Father, I pray that we would, be bring, that we would bring honor and glory to you. Father, we're thankful for your presence. May your children be obedient. Lord, we love you and pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand with me as we worship together? And the song we're going to sing, I have decided. I have decided to commit. I have decided to commit myself to him to make disciples. And so this might be your time just right there where you're sitting, where you're standing, just to bow your heads and pray. God, I don't understand totally what this idea is, but I'm willing to make disciples. Take me and use me. If you have other decisions, commitments to make, I'll be here at the front to pray with you, to share with you. There are others willing to do so. But may this time be about Him and not us. May we worship Him right now. I have decided to follow Jesus. much for being with us today to worshiping no grow go you're gonna get tired of hearing that I'm just warning you but that's the simple holistic approach to making disciples as we grow knowing him a personal relationship as we grow closer to him and reflecting looking like him that's what it's all about. We're not finished, church. It's not time to rest. It's time to move forward. May God bless you this week. May he use you to share his love. 
you'll notice in your bulletin if you did not receive one make sure you get one on your way out but uh, there's a couple of schedule opportunities uh, next Sunday we're going to be having baptism and uh, this will take place during the 1030 service at the very beginning we've got a couple from the first service that are going to be here and be involved in that please be faithful be here to support them and in two weeks we'll have Lord's Supper that will be Palm Sunday we'll have uh, Lord's Supper in both services and then on Easter Sunday morning the plan is to be outside we want to be outside but obviously we have no control over weather and we want to make it where we can spread out and get everybody here at 1030 only now if it doesn't work out that way we'll be back in here for two services 9 and 1030 just like normal but uh, we will try to give you a heads up please be patient uh, with your staff as we try to make a decision on weather like I said we have no control over that and uh, we our desire is to be able to be outside to place our eyes on that cross and give thanks for what Jesus has done as our risen Savior and Lord so God bless you this week may God use you and thank you all again for being here this morning. Once again, if you came this morning and you were visiting, we'll have visitors' uh, cards that you can fill out there in the lobby. Also, if you brought an offering this morning, the offering boxes are on the way out the door there. You'll pass them as you go out that door out there, so be sure to drop your offering off if you brought it this morning. Thank you again for being here. God bless you. You have a wonderful day, and I will just sing a song here while you guys head out the door. Take care.